Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the Third Coast Water Seminars. My name is Elena Harkness. I'm the Executive Director of Current, a Chicago-based water innovation hub. And I'm very excited to welcome you today for this conversation with Dr. Ludgard Raskin from the University of Michigan on researcher utility partnerships for advancing microbial drinking water quality. As always, the Third Coast Water Seminars are a collaborative endeavor presented by leading research institutions and national labs in our region, Northwestern University, the University of Illinois Ur Urbana-Champaign, the University of Chicago, University of Illinois at Chicago, and the Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, Current works with all of these partners and more to develop solutions to water challenges in our region. We're really excited to talk about this critical topic with all of you today. Some logistics if this is your first third coast and first time joining us. Uh, we do encourage interaction and we'd love for you to submit your questions for our speaker in the Q&A tab. If you have general comments, the chat tab will also be open to you. This event is being recorded like all of most of Current's events. Um, and this recording link will be shared out on Current's event page and our YouTube channel. So subscribe to that if you haven't. All of our past Third Coast seminars are also available there. And we'll also send out a link to this recording after the event. We have a very simple agenda for the Third Coast Water Seminars. I'll do a very brief welcome and introduction to Current, and then I'm going to turn it over to one of our key collaborators, Brian Chaplin, from the, Asso the Associate Professor of Chemical Engineering here at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He is going to introduce our speaker today, again, Dr. Ludgard Raskin, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. She's going to deliver her talk for about 40 minutes, and then we will take some time for audience Q&A and wrap you up right here at 4 o'clock. So a bit of background on current and why we're here. We are Chicago's water innovation hub, and we are five years young this year. We collaborate to do three things, grow the blue economy, drive innovation in water technology, and help solve persistent water challenges, both here in our region and beyond. We're all here because we share this desire to address our drinking water quality and the urban health of our urban environments. All of us need more healthy water to drink and less flood water in our basements. The challenges that we face in water all come to ground and we feel them locally, but these are truly global challenges. Water scarcity affecting two thirds of the world's population by 2025, the climate shifts that we see and feel here locally and in Chicago and throughout the Midwest, um, but also around the world in, in the form of rising coastlines, droughts, increased rainfall and other uh, extreme weather events. And of course, water quality, another issue that we feel acutely here, even in an area so uh, blessed with fresh and clean drinking water, um, everywhere is under threat from contamination, from plastics, other emerging contaminants. Uh, and these are all things that we need to address if we are to meet the collective challenge of better quality of life around the world. Our urgent need from Current's perspective is to help innovation happen faster. People aren't rallying fast enough behind the ideas and technologies that we need to protect our health and the environment. And we know in, in many cases that's for good reason. Innovation is hard. Innovation in water is especially difficult. And solving these complex challenges almost always requires collaboration of the kind that's represented here in the Third Coast Water Seminars, bringing together the best and brightest minds from across research, startups and innovators with great ideas, public sector uh, partners that have the ability to help test and prove out technologies and bring them into market. Current exists to be an unbiased advocate for those best water solutions, policies, and ideas. So our job is to scan the field, stay on top of the latest, independently assess these ideas and technologies, and help recommend them to bring them to ground here in Chicago, but also around the world. We're building a pipeline of water innovation, working on everything from sewage surveillance with many of the partners here in Third Coast, using wastewater to identify SARS-CoV-2 and other uh, important viruses that we're trying to track for public health, finding ways to target and destroy forever chemicals like PFAS, PFOAs, really important emerging area of science. And of course, lead detection and removal, a huge issue here in our home state of Illinois where we have more lead service lines than anywhere else in the nation. And we urgently need to find better ways to identify and eliminate lead in drinking water. It's a great segue to our topic today. We'll be talking about microbial water quality and hearing from a distinguished expert on this topic, Dr. Lutgard Raskin, who is the Vernon Snurink Distinguished University Professor of Environmental Engineering 
and the Russell O'Neill Professor of Engineering in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. To introduce our speaker and give further background, I'm going to turn it over to my good friend and collaborator, Brian Chaplin from the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's also one of the founders of the Third Coast Water Series. Brian, over to you to introduce Luke. Yeah, thanks a lot, Elena. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Luke Gard Raskin. As uh, Elena mentioned, she is a professor at the University of Michigan. She has been there since 2005. Uh, before that, she was a professor at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which is one of our partner institutions for Third Coast. And that's actually where we first met each other. She was a professor and I was a PhD student there. Uh, Lute is an expert in microbial aspects of anaerobic waste treatment, as well as drinking water treatment technologies. And she's going to highlight some of her work in those areas today. Uh, Lute is also a, an elected fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology, the International Water Association, and the Water Environmental Federation. And she also has numerous other past honors that I won't uh, go into length to mention today. She is also currently an associate editor for environmental science and technology. and was the Academy of Engineering, which is a, a fantastic honor. Uh, once again, we're very pleased and honored to have you here, Lute. And without further delay, I will turn it over to you for your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, and yes, thank you for inviting me. I think I, uh, I uh, have that uh, honor to thank you for that, but of course, also thanks to the Third Coast Water Seminar Series for hosting me. Um, I'm going to share my screen and ask if everybody can see things. Um, Perfect. All right. So um, you've, you've seen my title already, but uh, I'll just highlight it again if you, in case you joined a little bit late. So I would like to share some of the uh, research that we have done in partnership with a utility, um, and I'll give it away. It's the city of Ann Arbor, not surprisingly, because that's where the University of Michigan is located. And I'm going to um, emphasize some of the work that we've done specifically in the area of microbial drinking water quality. Um, before I get into this, um, for those of you who um, don't always think about drinking water, um, I just wanted to provide a few background slides and, and really emphasize that uh, even though I'm going to be talking about drinking water, uh, more and more are we moving to thinking about the one water concept. And that's represented here in my overview slide where um, we, we think about the engineered water cycle more and more as a single integrated system. So things are connected. It's not just drinking water. We have uh, storm water management, we have wastewater treatment, and all of these things are connected. Um, with this overview, I also want to emphasize to you that microorganisms play critically important roles across this whole water uh, cycle, uh, not just in wastewater treatment where we have studied them for a long time, but um, they're equally important in drinking water. And I hope to share some of that with you today. Um, and traditionally, we haven't thought so much about uh, the role of microorganisms in drinking water treatment, except for trying to remove them uh, because we think about them as pathogens in the drinking water field still. But, but there are important other roles for microbes in drinking water as well. Um, I find their role so important. So I would like to um, just highlight that by talking about water infrastructure microbiomes. They're, they're important throughout the engineered water cycle. Um, but beyond the engineered water cycle, I, I want to also emphasize that we shouldn't forget about the microbes in systems that connect to our engineered water cycle. The natural environment, uh, we take water out of the natu natural environment to produce drinking water, and then we use our drinking water. So we obviously are linking the microbiomes in our engineered infrastructure to the natural microbiomes and to the um, human microbiomes. Uh, we, and so we often don't study them together. And so I would like to uh, 
um, emphasize that there is these connections that we shouldn't forget about. Um, this slide uh, kind of makes that point even more clearly. Uh, you can think about the engineered water cycle and these uh, interconnections uh, of microbiomes, uh, the human and the natural water microbiomes with the other microbiomes. Um, and if you get intrigued thinking about this conceptually, I would like to recommend that you go to the special issue of the Current Opinion and Biotechnology Journal, where uh, Per Nielsen and I uh, edited a number of research art articles that really uh, take that perspective and talk about how these interfaces between the engineered water cycle microbiomes and human and natural system microbiomes are important and are important places where we can make advances for research in our field. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, drinking water and specifically about how uh, we as researchers can connect with utility partners to advance specifically in my case, microbial drinking water quality. And uh, in, in many cases that still means uh, reducing the risk of infections with pathogens. Um, and so you can see here, I'm highlighting this uh, by, by having you think about how we use water. It's not just drinking, but we also use our water uh, to take showers. And so um, bio aerosols that are generated uh, in our showers also become part of the microbiome in our lungs. And so there is, there is more to it than maybe uh, you might think at first glance. Um, I want to dive into this by giving you a little bit of an overview of how I've organized my presentation to make sure you don't get lost uh, with all the little tidbits that I'm going to share with you. Um, so when you think about um, these partnerships, you can think about what are the benefits that can emerge from partnerships like this. And so I've organized my talk around these benefits. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you that it's possible to expand our knowledge of real water systems. And when I say real water systems, I'm specifically talking about full-scale drinking water treatment plants. So by doing research with partners, you have that opportunity much more so than if you wouldn't have the uh, partnership because then you would be stuck doing the research in your lab. And now you can do research in a full scale system. So we can really expand knowledge beyond what we might be able to do in the lab. Um, we also may have the opportunity to make changes to real world practices by implementing results from research. Uh, we can um, think about building capacity. Once you have these relationships, how can you now collaboratively develop new projects uh, to benefit uh, the field. Um, and finally, it's important to think about the future of the water industry. So um, there are opportunities, I think, to co-create the future of the industry when once you develop these partnerships. And so I'm going to spend most of my time talking about examples that fit into this first category, but I want to keep a little bit of time giving you examples of these other areas that I think are also really important uh, as benefits emerging from such partnerships. So let me start um, by very quickly giving you an overview for those of you who don't think about drinking water all the time, uh, remind you what drinking water treatment uh, is, is all about. Um, it's, it's a process that uh, consists of multiple barriers for chemical and microbial contaminant removal. Uh, so you can see we take water out of the environment uh, send it through various treatment processes, for example, filtration, disinfection, um, and then we distribute the water to our homes in our cities. So um, we can uh, think about the roles of microbes um, from different angles, but traditionally in a drinking water treatment field, we try to remove microbes, as I mentioned. But despite of all these efforts, we keep a lot of microbes in our finished drinking water after treatment. And um, I'm, I'm showing you here the schematic of a conventional drinking water treatment plant, partly to remind you what that might look like. So you have coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, typically followed by filtration and disinfection. 
But I'm also wanting to show you this to highlight that in finished drinking water from a conventional drinking water treatment plant, you might have a million bacteria per liter of water left. Even though the system is working perfectly fine as you have designed it, it's still going to leave a large number of bacteria in your finished water. When you go to a different type of process, an ozone biofiltration plant, uh, where now in addition to some traditional processes, um, you would have an ozone contactor uh, before your filter that becomes a biofilter now because uh, ozone makes the organic material that's left at this point more biodegradable. So there will be more substrates available for microbes to grow in your filter. So you start relying on those microbes for treatment. And then you um, disinfect the finished uh, the, the water after biofiltration. And more and more, uh, we're switching towards using chloramine as a secondary disinfectant as opposed to chlorine. So in a treatment process like this one, you see even higher levels of bacteria in the finished drinking water in order to do orders of magnitude higher than in a conventional treatment plant. And again, that's perfectly fine. Maybe if you're not used to thinking about having these levels of bacteria, this might be a surprise, but this is typically uh, what we find and it's totally normal. Um, we, I also want to briefly uh, tell you about a group of microorganisms, uh, environmental microorganisms that we find in drinking water, um, the non-tuberculose mycobacteria. Uh, these are present in our source water, so it's not a surprise that we find them in our drinking water. Um, the concern with these groups of organisms is that some of the ones, uh, some of these um, I'm going to use this acronym NTM here. Some of these NTM, non-tuberculose mycobacteria, are opportunistic pathogens. So they can uh, make some uh, people sick. Uh, they can cause infections in, in sensitive populations. Um, most of our drinking water in the US contains these organisms. Uh, they're very prevalent in shower biofilms. Uh, you can, if you look at the microbial community in a shower biofilm, about 10% of that community consists of NTM. So they're quite abundant, not just uh, prevalent in terms of the types of microbes that we find. Um, and some of them um, are clinically relevant and, and who have the potential to cause disease because they're opportunistic pathogens. Um, not all opportunistic pathogens that are NTM are found in drinking water, but some of them are found in drinking water. And we've known about this for a long time. Uh, in fact, you may have heard of this organism, Mycobacterium avium. It's been on the US EPA's contaminant candidate lists for a long time. Um, and so we, the, the EPA and people in the drinking water field have known about this for a while, but there's an increased interest in this because the incidence of infections with NTM have been uh, going up. And so we're, we're trying to think about these organisms uh, more deeply than, than we have in the past. Um, I've been studying organisms in the context of drinking water for a long time. And uh, I started this work actually when I was still at the University of Illinois, collaborating with Professor uh, Benito Marinas. Uh, we published a number of papers and um, we did mostly pure culture and co-culture work at the time. Uh, we, found that these NTM are resistant to disinfectants. Um, we also observed that when you expose a pure culture of Mycobacterium avium to low concentrations of a disinfectant like chloramine, this organism actually responds by having um, some kind of an adaptive response. So it becomes more resistant to the disinfectant after uh, it's been exposed to these low levels. And we also studied these organisms in, uh, in co-cultures, they, they often grow uh, inside of protozoa, Acanthamoebae castellania is shown here. And so you could see these bacterial cells and some of them are inside of this protozoa cell. And you can imagine that that lifestyle makes these organisms even more resistant to disinfectants. So these organisms are well adapted to survive disinfectants in our drinking water systems. Uh, makes them really interesting to study, but makes them hard to get rid of. Um, we also studied um, 
the, these types of organisms in mixed communities. So we started out in pure cultures, moved down to co-cultures, and then thought it was important to start studying uh, disinfection of mixed communities because that's obviously what you find in a biofilter. Um, we um, started out in the lab, and I'm going to show you just one plot from a published from a paper that we published in ESNT some years ago. And I'm plotting here the uh, the relative abundance of different populations um, from a sample in a lab scale biofilter. We took that sample and exposed it to chloramine. And then what you'll see over time, um, you see a, a selective change in the community composition of the uh, viable organisms. So after exposure to chloramine, and you see here in the x-axis the concentration of chloramine multiplied by the time of exposure, the CT value, um, you could see that with larger CT values, you see enrichments of certain populations in this uh, mixed community. So this is very intriguing. It's one of the first times that we were able to demonstrate with molecular methods that there is these selective enrichments when you expose mixed communities to uh, disinfectants. So we, um, as I mentioned, we, we wanted to study things uh, in full scale drinking water systems. So when um, I, um, I went to um, Ann Arbor, um, we started um, thinking about collaborating with full scale systems to be able to study processes um, like this. So this is that ozone biofiltration system that you saw before. And when you start thinking about the opportunities for oxidants or disinfectants to be in contact with these mixed communities, you can see that there's many of them. So uh, first one, uh, the ozone uh, is, comes into contact with the mixed community of microbes at the end of that preliminary treatment. Um, you have Chloramine, in this case, in your um, filter backwash. So your microbes in your biofilter are frequently exposed to uh, chloramine. And then again, in the distribution system, you have uh, exposure of the chloramine uh, to the, the microbial communities exposed to the chloramine. So there's multiple opportunities for shaping the drinking water microbiome uh, using these oxidants. And if you keep in mind that these uh, organisms, these NTMs, are particularly resistant to these accidents, much more so than other microbes in the community. You can imagine that these are perfect um, opportunities to shape the community in a way that maybe isn't as desirable as, as we would like. So this is something that um, we, we really wanted to dive into, and we wanted to study this in real systems. So I'm going to uh, now show you some some data with um, real system with a real system, and this is where our collaboration with the city of Ann Arbor started. Uh, so here's my map to uh, remind you where where we are. I don't think um, most of you need that reminder, but um, we are collaborating with um, a, a drinking water treatment plant that's an ozone biofiltration plant that services about 125,000 people. Um, in Ann Arbor and the surrounding areas. So um, here is that system again. Um, so uh, we have our ozone primary disinfectant, and then we have chloramine as our secondary disinfectant, and our biofilter is a really important step in that process. Um, so um, these organisms, these NTMs, are selected for in that system in the city of Ann Arbor. Um, and, and that's not surprising with the background that I provided you, but let me um, show you some early data where we actually um, confirmed that that was the case. Um, so this plot looks a little bit similar to a plot that I showed you before. I'm showing the relative abundance of a whole bunch of different microbes in our water at different points. One bar represents the effluent from the biofilter. Um, one bar represents uh, the water right after the chloramine contactor. And then this bar represents the water inside of the distribution system. 
And this is the first time that we realized that there is a relatively high abundance of NTM in uh, the Ann Arbor uh, finished drinking water in the distribution system. So the uh, total cell count, as a reminder, is about 10 to the 8 cells. And the uh, NTM sometimes make up um, a, a decent percentage, as you can see here. So you can have uh, sometimes 10 to the 5th or 10 to the 6th uh, NTM cells in the finished drinking water. Um, of course, that was not where we were going to stop. We wanted to study this in more detail. And um, with this collaboration, we had a chance to study what might be taking place in the ozone contact area. And the beauty of these types of collaborations is that PhD students can really go inside of these systems and pick samples that um, they would have never um, dreamt of having access to. So here you see a photo with two of our PhD students, Nadine Kautlaris and Nicole Rocky, both are former PhD students now. And one of the um, staff from the city of Ann Arbor going inside of an ozone contactor that had been shut down uh, for some time and, and was safe, safe to access. And what they found was um, layers of sludge at the bottom of that ozone contactor. And um, they were taking samples, not just from the water in the ozone contactors, but now also uh, from the biofilms that were growing on the sludge and on the walls of the contactor. And then um, you can uh, see the schematic here um, to help you think about the data that I'm going to show you. This is one of the four ozone contactors. Um, and you could see that there's um, five different sampling ports to collect water. But because we were able to get in there, we were also able to collect um, the sludge and the biofilms on the walls of the contactor. So first, let's look at the water samples. Uh, we used flow cytometry to count the uh, membrane intact cells in these different locations. And not surprisingly, you find really high levels of microorganisms before ozone is applied. And then it goes down after ozone is applied. But what, what was very surprising to us is that you see an increase in the levels of intact cells after ozone is applied. And then the effluent is uh, much higher in uh, terms of membrane intact cells than we had expected. Um, when we look at um, the NTM populations, inside of those water samples in three different locations, so location one, three, and five, you could see that the relative abundance doesn't appear to be that high, but it's significant. Uh, it's in some cases close to 1% of the community. And so we knew that something was going on in this ozone contactor in terms of NTM selection. And so we uh, were able to uh, think a little bit more about this here. I'm also uh, highlighting the absolute concentrations of these NTM populations, not just the relative abundances. And so you could see um, the absolute abundance goes down in the contactor, but remains at about 5,000 cells per liter. So there's a substantial number of cells of NTM left. And when we uh, started analyzing the samples that um, were taken from biofilms and sludge, uh, you'll see that across the ozone contactor, you see a higher uh, relative abundance of these NTM in the total community that you analyze. So uh, the red uh, parts of these bar represent all different types of NTM species. And you can see that they remain substantial in these different biofilm samples. So, um, back to my water slide. So what we hypothesized in this paper that you can look up in ESNT that we published a couple of years ago, what we hypothesized is that the, the, the ability to survive in these biofilms on the walls and in the sludge of the ozone contactor allows these organisms to, to slough off and therefore contribute to these relatively high levels in the water. Uh, and, and that was a great surprise. Um, if you do ozone experiments in the lab, you find that it's a very effective uh, disinfectant. So you would not have expected this high abundance of bacteria. And um, the 
certainly the high abundance of NTM is, is of concern and is of interest to study further. Um, we continued to work with our partners and thought, okay, should we study what happens with the biofiltration here now? Because we know that our effluent from the ozone contactor has a decent amount of these NTM organisms and those go into the biofilter. So what happens there? Especially considering we have uh, chloraminated water that's used for backwashing the filters. Um, so um, when we started out, we um, confirmed that there was an enrichment. So here is the absolute abundance of NTM before and after the filter. So there's about a hundred fold enrichment across the filter of these types of organisms. Um, but we wanted to dive into it a little bit more and we wanted to see whether the concentration of chloramine in the backwash um, was potentially contributing to selective enrichment in the filter. So we first wanted to measure chloramine in the filter. And I'm going to show you some data of samples collected at the top of the filter bed. Um, so the question we tried to answer was, is chloramine present at measurable concentrations during backwashing? Um, and here's our team at the time. So you recognize Nicole Rocky and Nadine Cutlers, but we had another grad student, uh, Jimmy Youngs, and a postdoc, Sarah Haig, who are sitting here actually on top of one of the filters in the filter gallery of the uh, treatment plant. So they took samples and measured chloramine. And what you can see is that at the top of the filter, um, during the time of backwashing, so we sampled for 10 minutes, uh, you see low levels of chloramine, but they're measurable. And so I like to think about them as sublethal concentrations of chloramine because they're sufficiently um, high to have an impact on the microbes, but they're not high enough to perhaps kill, off, kill all of the microbes. And so remember that adaptive response of the pure culture of NTM that we observed in the work in Illinois, uh, that's exactly what might be happening here uh, with these sublethal concentrations of chloramine. Um, we um, asked ourselves, are there relevant NTM present in the full-scale biofilters, clinically relevant NTM? Um, so we developed methods to try to answer those questions. And here again, you see our team on top of the filter, but now you can also look down on the filter and you can see this uh, sampling device that we um, constructed. And we were able to get uh, the granular activated carbon with the biofilm attached uh, using this device. And so we were able to get these uh, samples with biomass from different locations in the filter bed using that sampling device. And then we um, used a method uh, that Sarah Haig developed uh, to uh, look at the different species and strains of NTM. And what we found is that there is quite a diversity of NTM. And here you see all of the different species of mycobacteria that we found. But it's really obvious that one of them is dominant throughout the filter bed. So both in the bottom, middle, and top sample, if you look at the relative abundance of all of these NTM, there's one dominant one, and that's the Amavium that we know is clinically relevant. So we knew that um, this was um, an important topic that we should continue to study to, to get a better handle on this. Um, we also um, did an experiment to demonstrate that these organisms are actually active and that they were expressing relative genes inside of this environment. So we developed a method um, to look at the transcription and specifically focusing on expression of one of the genes that these NTMs have and that allows them to get inside of protozoa, but also when they infect humans, allows the cells to infect human cells. And that gene that we um, developed a method for is called the mammalian cell entry gene. And uh, I have just some bits here of transcriptional data. Uh, in this plot, I'm showing you on the right Y axis, the chloramine concentration again during backwashing at the top of the filter. So that's the same type of data that I showed you earlier, these red dots. 
Um, and so you see these sublethal concentrations. On the left y-axis, you see the expression data, so relative expression of this mammalian cell entry gene. And you can see that during backwashing, we see an increase in the relative expression. And so these genes are specific for NTM. They're a, a, an um, environmentally and clinically relevant gene that's being expressed in the drinking water filter during backwashing. And so that demonstrated to us that this is something that certainly deserves further study. Um, and we, we kept going and working with our partners. Um, we um, also looked um, in another study with Sarah Hagen, the lead, at what was going on in the distribution system and in home plumbing. Um, I'm not going to show you um, lots of details, but I just wanted to uh, highlight that when you move into the distribution system and when you move into your homes, you get a continuous increase in the levels of these uh, organisms. So when you're close to the plant in the distribution system, um, you might find you know, 10 to the fourth or so cells per liter, but when you move further away from the plant, you get higher levels in the distribution system and in your home after overnight stagnation, that first sample that you collect from your home uh, is going to have even higher levels of these organisms. Um, this is the left y-axis that I was talking about here in red. When you look at total bacterial cells, you see a similar pattern, but it's not nearly as uh, pronounced. So on the right y-axis, I'm showing total bacterial cells. So you, these, you see this slight increase across the distribution system and into your home plumbing. But it's much more prevalent uh, when you look at specific populations that um, tend to be enriched when they're exposed to these disinfectants. Um, I want to um, move on to my next point um, and it, you know, giving you that overview of a lot of the knowledge that we gained, I want to see how we could potentially start using that knowledge. Um, and so especially for utility people, that is really important, I think. So we um, decided um, to partner, continue to partner and see if we could work on uh, using our knowledge to see if we could reduce selection for these NTM in the filters. And as you can imagine, it's not that easy to change things at a treatment plant because um, you're stuck with the treatment plant you have. Uh, it's plumped in a certain way, so you can't really change a whole lot. And you have to deal with um, the regulator. So you don't have a lot of flexibility. Uh, but we wrote a um, tailored collaboration proposal um, to get funding to do a project to specifically address this. And so we got funding from the Water Research Foundation as a, in, in this partnership. And we decided that we could potentially reduce the selective pressure by reducing the backwash frequency. So we studied uh, six full-scale filters. Um, we have baseline data for a couple of months. Uh, this started at the end of 2017, as you can see. And then we split our six filters into um, um, a set of controls and a set of experimental filters, and we studied them for six months. So our control filters, um, we continued operating like, or we, that is the operators of the Ann Arbor treatment plant, because uh, I was not involved in operating any of this. Uh, but the, the operators continue to operate these three control filters the way they always do. And then the experimental filters, they agreed to backwash them less frequently. So we reduced substantially the chloramine exposure. Um, we, um, when we first started analyzing our results um, and we determined the relative abundance of the NTM in samples that we took from these um, six different types of filters. We first started seeing um, that perhaps the NTM were indeed lower, uh, the relative abundance of the NTM appeared to be lower in the experimental filters where there was less exposure to chloramine. Um, it wasn't really conclusive, uh, but you see that especially in the middle and the bottom samples, we didn't see much of NTM using this approach where we measured relative abundance. 
when we used a more quantitative method and looked at the actual concentrations of NTM cells per gram of activated carbon, granular activated carbon that's biologically active, we did not see a significant difference between the filters, uh, the, the backwashed filters, or the filters backwashed as usual every three days, or the backwashed the filters backwashed in a reduced schedule with less chloramine exposure. So we believe that at this point, our strategy um, isn't going to work. Um, the experiment was run only for six months. So of course there is a possibility that running the system longer, uh, allowing the microbial community to um, get shaped for a longer time period, perhaps we would see an effect, but it's not a strategy that um, is, is particularly successful. So our hypothesis didn't really pan out the way we had hoped. Um, we also tried a different strategy. Um, we couldn't um, um, perform that strategy at the full scale level, but uh, we were able to work with a really nice pilot system. So we had, this was set up inside the filter gallery at the full scale plan. So, we, you know, we tried to simulate as much as we could the actual full scale system. And we had the control system was operated as usual with backwashing with chloramine. And then we backwashed with filter effluent, two of the pilots. And we also backwashed with dechloraminated finished water. And in this pilot study, again, our results aren't as conclusive as we would like them to be. Um, the, the hypothesis may not hold up. Um, these strategies may not be sufficient to eliminate the NTM from the filters uh, in the time periods that we studied them. So we need to go back to the drawing board and think about different strategies to address this concern. Uh, but this is one example where we tried, uh, as I said, to um, make changes to real world practices. Um, we learned a lot during, do, during the process, but we haven't actually come up with a strategy that's gonna be uh, practical for the Ann Arbor treatment plan to implement. Um, while we did all this, we worked on new collaborative projects. Some of them emerged uh, serendip serendipitously uh, and others um, uh, we, we deliberately developed. Um, and I'll just show you very briefly too. I, I don't think I have enough time to do justice to them, but I wanna show you some possibilities for those of you who are interested in partnerships. Um, we we um, developed a um, distribution system monitoring um, campaign to help the utility think about the flushing protocol that they use for compliance sampling. Um, they have a very set um, protocol, and the idea is that they sample the distribution system. But what we were able to demonstrate with our sampling effort is that their five minute flushing protocol that they typically use doesn't always hit the distribution system in the locations that they sample. And this became very apparent in the pandemic. So when you look at this data here, you see the total chlorine plotted in the y-axis, and you can see the time period. Um, if you look at site two, for example, um, where um, the building was shut down during the pandemic, you see that the water quality in terms of chlorine concentrations changes drastically for the first draw or after overnight stagnation. But even that five minute flush that's supposed to represent the distribution system doesn't really come close to the full flush, which represents the distribution system. In these other sites um, that uh, where the buildings weren't closed, things are looking a little bit better, but there was still a difference. And so the utility is now discussing whether they should be adjusting their flushing protocols based on this data set. Um, another um, project that we got into is comparing, um, well, uh, looking at startup strategies because the utility is dealing with um, regulations for PFAS that are changing. And so they, they're changing out their granular activated carbon much more frequently, and they're changing to a different type of granular activated carbon. And they're um, seeing that 
uh, when they start up their filters now much more frequently with this new carbon, they're starting to see uh, problems with nitrification. So higher levels of nitrite are being observed in these uh, new media. And so we're um, helping them think about this and studying the microbial communities in these filters during the startup period. And uh, this is a plot that uh, shows you some of these data. So it's a plot that shows all of the microbes together in this principal coordinate analysis. So each dot represents a microbial community in a filter. So what um, you'll see here is that in uh, the old filters, uh, you get communities that are relatively closely aligned. They're similar in composition. Uh, when you start up the filters, things start deviating from this. So uh, you can see that over the startup time period, you get differences in communities that develop. And eventually, after six months, you get closer to that stable community that we have on the long-term filters. It takes more than six months to get there. Uh, and we stopped sampling at six months. So we're now redoing some of that work specifically in the context of these nitrification problems. So again, an example of a collaboration that developed because we were right there and we thought, okay, we can, we can help out and start doing some interesting research. Um, I can give you quite a few more examples, but I know I'm running out of time and I didn't want to add more of them. I, I did, however, want to talk very briefly about how we can also contribute to co-creating uh, the future of the industry and particularly the future workforce. Um, so um, we um, think and talk a lot about this with our partners. And so we decided to co-organize um, a workshop for other, um, uh, for across the state of Michigan. So we felt that our example of this partnership could be inspirational for other uh, researchers and utilities in the state of Michigan. And so we organized this drinking water innovation salon where we um, did a lot of brainstorming and also shared some of our experiences. Uh, so that's one example of how we are trying to extend our example of a partnership to, to other um, utilities and researchers. Um, and another point that uh, has come out of this collaboration is that um, people at the utility are now assisting us at the university to help educate future water professionals. And specifically, uh, Brian Steglitz, who is the water treatment manager, is actually teaching one of our courses. Um, and this course is called Practical Engineering Solutions to Drinking Water Challenges. He's offered it once so far and it got really excellent reviews and he will be offering it again uh, this coming uh, winter semester. So um, these partnerships um, provide um, these hands-on real world learning opportunities that our students, both undergrads and grads are really looking for. Um, and it definitely benefits the industry because uh, people can start looking for future employees and recruit students, help motivate them to join the water industry. So there's mutual benefits to these partnerships way beyond research and even improvement in water quality. Um, so I'm going to end my talk by um, just kind of highlighting how valuable these experiences have been for us. Um, you can uh, do uh, innovative work. Uh, you can make your work more meaningful and you can have a lot of fun on the way. And I hope I conveyed some of that fun that our grad students had with uh, working at the full scale plant. Um, but I, for those researchers who have some doubts, I also want to tell you that that research that you can do at a full scale facility um, can be really valuable uh, from a research perspective. You can publish in high quality journals, you can really increase our knowledge in the drinking water field much beyond that particular utility. I think what we learned uh, by doing work at the city of Ann Arbor goes way beyond the city of Ann Arbor. So it, it is a valuable research that um, can advance your work as a researcher. So it's, it's not just only applied work that is not gonna see the light of day beyond the particular utility. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, I need to acknowledge our partners uh, at the city of Ann Arbor. Um, and you could see Brian Stiglitz and Sarah Page in particular, but there's a long list of other partners, including operators. And here you see uh, several people from our team and from the city in front of that pilot that I showed you earlier. So you could see we, it, we have a, a really awesome team of, of students, faculty, and professionals working together. And then this is my acknowledgement slide, focusing a little bit more on the uh, students, postdocs, and faculty collaborators, and also an acknowledgement of um, various funding sources. So with this, uh, I'm going to stop. I think I'm slightly over time, but hopefully there's a little bit of time for questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Luke. There are several questions that I just want to say up front. Um, thank you for making the benefits on both sides for researchers and for the utilities so clear in this presentation. Uh, there are, I know there are both both researchers and a lot of utilities that tune into the Third Coast Water Seminar. It's a lot of that kind of collaboration we're really um, seeking to spur with these conversations. So thank you for addressing that uh, so directly. Uh, and I loved particularly the part where you talked about it not bearing out the hypothesis that you you know kind of thought might happen, like the learning from things not going the way you expect them to is so much a part of the innovation process and doing it in a, at a scale that is lower risk to utilities and to the public that they serve is really important. So these kinds of projects uh, really help to do that. So I wanna stick on that for a second and ask, what were some of the features of the partnership with the city of Ann Arbor that made it particularly you know, feasible to get a project like this off the ground? Because I, you know, again, I know there are utilities on the line that might be thinking about well, how can we make this more possible? What are some of the things that we need to do organizationally, administratively to make it easier to partner with researchers? Yes, um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think that um, one thing that I so much appreciate with, the, with our partners is that they've never been worried about sharing information that we find. Uh, obviously, this topic that we studied is, is a tough one because we are finding opportunistic pathogens in their drinking water. And they have taken the approach, uh, you can publish anything that you find. Uh, we, we'd like to be involved. We'd like to know what you're going to publish. But we don't want to hide anything because uh, we can learn from this. We can show that our customers and the public that we are a very proactive utility and we're going to address any problems that we find. And so that approach has really benefited us as researchers, um, because you know if they had been reluctant to allow us to publish what we found, um, you know that for for somebody who is on a tenure track appointment, for example, that's not going to work, right? Because you have pressure to publish, or the PhD students have pressure to publish. Mm -hmm. So that's probably the number one thing. But then the other things are just, I mean, their openness to. Uh, troubleshoot, to participate in research, to ask dif difficult questions, to share information um, is just being tremendous. Um, I always joke with them, like, whenever we can come over, I, I learn so much new information because there's so much knowledge there that they don't even know that they have and that they're not necessarily sharing with us. It kind of comes out when you go and meet with them and then yep. You know, you push and ask questions and you learn so much every single time when you connect. Yeah, well, and I'm sure there's a lot of things that you're doing to be a good partner to, you know, help make it easier for these utilities that have this huge demand of delivering a public service every single day to be able to participate. But we can get into that at another time. And I want to encourage everyone, your contact information is up on screen to follow up. I do have um, some technical questions I want to address. One, as we're thinking about how some of your findings, uh, you know, interact with or inform maintenance of you know these facilities um, you talked about the ozone contactor and there was a question how long was that out of service prior to the sampling happening i think the the underlying issue here is like how does this mm -hmm. serve as an operation yeah right um i i don't know exactly but i'll tell you what i know i they have four ozone contactors and they um i think run only two at any given time uh, so they have the ability to go through a thorough cleaning. And I believe they do that once a year. Uh, so uh, when they shut down an ozone contactor, it has to degas and you know it has to be out of operation for quite a while before it's safe to enter. And so then um, we had to wait for that 
time period. So, you know, I, I think it could have been a few weeks before we were able to enter into that ozone contactor. That one obviously wasn't cleaned out when we entered it because we wanted to catch what was going on. Um, um, so we found it in the state right before cleaning, I guess. And um, uh, we are currently doing another study with the ozone contactor where we um, actually started sampling, um, this time with a real-time flow cytometer, um, right after they had cleaned out. So kind of the startup after cleaning of the ozone contactor to get at some of these questions that were developed out of that first study. Got it. Um, a couple of more questions about ozone concentration in the contractor. What, what was that ozone concentration? And um, it, I, I think, so this is determined by the regulator. Um, I think they need to meet 0.3 milligrams per liter of ozone at all times, but they uh, overshoot. And so on average, I think it's more likely to be 0.5 milligrams per liter. And have you correlated NTM cell counts with ozone concentrations that you're observing along the contactor? Is that possible? Um, yeah, we, we certainly were not able to uh, do that with our previous work. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to get a little bit more into this with um, this new study where we uh, have a much longer, well, we, we have a very extensive real-time data set of mm -hmm. um, intact cells uh, in uh, different samples in this ozone contactor. We also have the ozone concentrations that we collect as much as we can. Um, it's going to be tricky because there is so much variation, but mm -hmm. yeah, we're definitely going to attempt to do some modeling of those data sets. Great. Then a question about the disinfection byproduct. So chlorine-based disinfectants can also introduce other carcinogenic compounds and other things in water. Do those have an impact on these microbial communities, like the actual byproducts of um, Yes. And... I, in, in our study, that is not something that we got into. And I think the level of our work probably, the answer is probably not, but this question is the broader one. Like the, the reason a lot of utilities have switched to using chloramine as opposed to chlorine is exactly because of the regulated disinfection byproducts when you use chlorine, right? But then of course, chloramine has other disinfectant, disinfection byproducts to worry about. Yeah. Um, there, there may be effects on the microbial community, but but as far as I know, not on these NTM, and we didn't get into that. Yeah. Um, and what is the relative risk associated with NTM concentrations that you observed in the finished drinking water? If you're thinking about making decisions based on this, like how do you think yeah. about this risk? Um, this is, that's a, yeah, a tough question. There is, um, yeah. people have, started to do some microbial quantitative microbial risk assessment for these NTM populations in the drinking water field. We contributed to a publication that hopefully will be coming out soon in that context. It's 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 really early though to, to answer that question because most of the exposure is not directly through your drinking water. It's through um, inhalation uh, when you take showers or when you flush toilets and mm -hmm. so on. And so we, we have very little data mm -hmm. on the, um, uh, the, the abundance of these populations in those air results. It's very difficult work. Right. We're actually, um, I had a former postdoc, Yun Chen, I didn't present her work. She, Yun is uh, an amazing researcher who's currently a junior faculty at UC Riverside. We're working on a publication from her postdoc and she quantified the different NTM populations in air results generated in showers. And then she tried to look at the viability of these organisms in the bioaerosols. So we're working towards answering your question, but it is a difficult one and I'm not comfortable answering yeah, it. Sure, sure, sure. What, I did have a sense of the yeah. what, what uh, In terms of like the clinical relevance, there are more and more people who, like we, we see an increase in NTM infections and people are getting sick and the one of the exposure routes is definitely drinking water. So when you're in certain... Um, groups that I'm a perfect target to get an anti-M infection, like mm -hmm. older female, you know, there, there are certain risk factors. And I'm, um, I, I think there is, it, yeah, I wouldn't just dismiss it as it's not relevant. Yeah. For, yeah. 
And then final final question to wrap it up, and I know we're at time. Um, do you think given the you know decreased availability of clean drinking water around the world, do you think we're going to need to consider barrier approaches like membranes in most drinking water plants in the future? I mean, what's what's the sort of future projection on this? Um, to keep our okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, membranes are one option, but there's if we would understand these uh, systems better, uh, we could we could also yeah. get away without membranes in some cases. I mean, for example, biofiltration is becoming much more common in the water reuse field, even. Yeah. And so, it, it, when you start thinking about, um, yeah, these understanding these selection pressures and trying to create a healthy microbiome in your biofilter then perhaps these microbial issues are, are not as, as, you know, as they are right now. Uh, so getting rid of disinfectants would be one way, but of yep. course it's not gonna happen in the US, but right. anyway, right. it's, right. yeah, the, these are tough questions to answer in a, in a short time period, yes. but really good ones. <laughs> well, thank you so much for uh, teeing up so many important issues for us. And, and again, I just can't underscore enough how important it is for you to be highlighting the kind of co-benefits of these university researcher partnerships. So thanks for that. I know there are gonna be a lot of people on this presentation that want to follow up and learn more. Uh, we're so grateful you were here. I, my colleague George has just launched uh, an audience poll for you. In the meantime, as we close out, I wanna encourage everybody to stay tuned and look ahead, even though we're just at the beginning of summer, look ahead to the fall. Chicago Water Week is coming October 11th through 15th, and we are looking for program partners right now. So wherever you are, if you'd like to get in front of this, uh, it's a largely Chicago-based audience, but we have global partners and national partners as well. Um, there's a QR code on your screen that'll take you to our program partner form, and those are gonna be due to us uh, in mid-June, June 18th. So encouraging partners of all kinds, and would love to have a really robust set of programs teed up for Water Week. Also, uh, just to tee up the next a couple events hosted by Current, we have a Water Around the World on Smart and Sustainable Water Infrastructure in American Cities uh, coming up on June 7th. And then our next Third Coast will feature uh, one of our local collaborators, George Wells from Northwestern University. So thanks again, everyone. You know We are here because of you. We are powered by partnerships. We're so happy you're here and part of our problem solving community in and for water. Uh, reach out to us if you have any suggestions about what we can do uh, more and better and differently. And we are just looking forward to seeing you in our next event. Be well, everyone, and enjoy the start of summer. And thanks again to Lute for a wonderful presentation. Take care, everyone. <laughs>